Last week I was speaking at a business um, retreat in Palm Springs, and my entire family was there for the first time in probably 15 or 20 years. And it was really fun to have John and Julia there as adults, to have our grandkids there. And, you know, all of them didn't come in to speak because there's a great big pool outside. And it was 110 degrees even in the morning in Palm Springs. But John and Julie came in to hear me speak. And afterwards, when it was done, I'd normally, I'd spent all day Saturday while they were out at the pool listening to speakers and taking notes and doing all those things because they're speakers that come, you know, from around the nation. And I felt very fortunate to get to hear them. And so then Sunday morning afterwards, I ditched out on the speakers to go hang out with my family for a little while. So while you were in church here, I was laying at a poolside out there. And there was John who had taken the day off from church, I'm um, at his church, to be there. And he looked at me and he said, so dad, I'm just curious, I really liked your opening illustration. I said, well, thanks, son. I said, what part did you like about it? He said, well, I liked the part where you talked about it being optional that, you know, and that life is optional, that Christianity is optional, that your relationship with God is optional. I said, well, thanks, son. You know, I try to do that. It's a business setting, so I want to make sure that they understand right from the front that, you know, this isn't being forced down their throat. This is optional for each one of them. And then he said this. He said, but I think I would have stopped there, Dad. He said, I think you went about 25 minutes too long. And I looked at him, and I felt like throwing him in the pool and just holding him under for a little while. You know, I want you to know there are a lot of preachers who appreciate critiques after the message. I'm not one of them. I mean, I'm just not. I mean, this is what I like after the message. I like that encouraging word that says, thank you, Pastor Eric. That blessed me so much. That's what I like after the message. I, my son, I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's finishing his master's in divinity degree. He's a la da Presbyterian now, which I can't even spell. And, you know, suddenly he's got the opportunity to evaluate his old man up there saying, yeah, Dad, I would have stopped it right about there. But you ended up going an additional 20. So, in that vein, this morning, I'm going to jump right into the text. The card's inside your program this morning. This is the last message from this series, Living Instruments. And this is about, or I'm sorry, Incredible Instruments. So today I want to talk about how to live out our love. We've been in Romans, the 12th chapter, and we literally, we could spend the rest of our lives in just Romans, the 12th chapter, and never have to go anyplace else in the Bible. And there are so many of you who spend so much of your time in all of the Bible, and you get a little bit of it from all over the place, instead of actually getting some part of it that you're going to live by. And I think about the miracle of what it is that 2,000 years ago this letter was written to the church at Rome. And somehow, 2,000 years later, this letter that profoundly changed the community at Rome is still profoundly changing lives today and can change our lives. And today, this lesson that's so direct on what it means just to live your love. Because so many of us, we like to say that we believe that God loves us. And many of us, we like to say that God is love. And many of us even take that next step that says we love God everybody. How many of you in Christ Jesus, you love everybody? Raise your hand right now. And how many of you are living that out on a daily basis? Oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. By the end of this message, I'm going to ask the same question. I just want, I just want you to know that it's a challenge for us to live out our love, isn't it? And you see, if we're not living out our love, then you've got a question, do you have love in you? You see, because if you're not living it out, it's not love. That's just it. And for us to understand that, do it. So this is how Paul begins this from Romans, the 12th chapter. This is verses 9 through 13. He says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Ouch. You mean we can't just go to church on Sunday, dress nicely, hug each other when it's in, hey, go ahead and greet the person behind you, you know, share the peace. Everyone be nice to each other, go home and pretend to love each other. No, you've got to really love them. 
I've got to really love these people I disagree with. I've got to really love these people from a different socioeconomic background. I've got to really love these people who are different from me politically. I've got to really love these people who are from a different ethnic or racial background. I've got to really love these people who live in a different neighborhood than I do. I've got to really, don't just pretend to love people, but really love them. Hate what is wrong. What is, let's read that out loud together, all right? This is really short. It's just four words. Let's say it out loud together. Hate what is wrong. All right, should we be in opposition to what is wrong? Or should we hate what is wrong? Should we just ignore what is wrong? Or should we hate what is wrong? We should hate what is wrong. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Ouch. I mean, it's one thing to honor someone. Pastor Ken's birthday was this week. Happy birthday, Ken, again. Um, Ken usually hates it when he's put on the spot or lifted up like that. But on the way out, make sure to hug Ken and tell him happy birthday. Ken turned 63. Ken's always kind of right behind me there. And he always likes to always remind me that, you know, I'm just right ahead of him, you know. And so, but I just am always amazed we're both just getting old. I mean, that's the incredible part, that here we are getting old. And, and as we go out, I mean, I think to myself, you know, to make sure, I mean, to take delight in honoring someone like Ken who honors us all year long. I mean, with his service to the church. And not just to do it because he deserves it or because he's earned it, but because we do what? We take delight in it. We take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. Ouch. Never be lazy. I remember turning 21 and my um, college roommate gave me a little book called Mr. Lazy. Maybe some of you have seen it. I've still got it someplace. It's got a little chubby guy who's sitting there, funny looking little guy, Mr. Lazy, and it tells the story of Mr. Lazy as you go through this thing. I don't know about you, but I love having those days of laziness. I was coming in today and Tom said to me, hey, you going to see Emperor on Wednesday? And I said, nope, I'm not. You feel free to talk to Ken, but this is Labor Day weekend. Labor Day week, I take this week. I, for 28 years, I've been taking this week off. He said, well, going to um, Siempre isn't work. You can still go to Siempre. That's not work at all. You can go. And I'm like, work for me, Tom. I mean, you want to talk about this after church? Either way, but however it works down. And I'm thinking, I kind of dig being, how many of you like being lazy sometimes? I just kind of occasionally enjoy being, I mean, and what do you do with a verse like this? Never be lazy. I mean, it's just like John 3, 16, you know. There it is in the Bible. Never be lazy, and then even, it gets even more difficult. Work hard. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. How? Enthusiastically. Not because you have to. Not because you're willing to. Not because he died on a cross for you, and doggone it, I guess I need to do this. But enthusiastically. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Hopefully you have a confident hope today of heaven. Hopefully you have a confident hope that you have no doubt of what your salvation's about. You have no doubt about eternal life. That's your confident hope. And you can rejoice in that confident hope and then be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Again, does it say always be ready to practice hospitality? Does it say always be willing to practice hospitality? It says always be... I can't wait, man. I can't wait. It's so good to see you, Chris, man. I'll tell you, I can't wait to practice hospitality all over you, man. I can't wait. I threw a guy off the parking lot this week because he was sleeping in our parking lot in his car. I had seen him Sunday night when I got back from the streets. I'd gotten a call Saturday from someone telling me he was here. He'd had his car towed here. And so I got here Sunday night back from the streets, one o'clock in the morning, it was a late night. And so I go over there, check him out. There's this guy with his girlfriend sleeping in the car. I said, I'll tell you what, 
I'll give you to tomorrow, and then we're going to be calling the police to have your car towed away. So you need to be off our property. So I drove back Monday. I didn't really call the police. I drove back Monday night. I came over Monday evening right about sunset. I stepped in. Sure enough, he was still out there. He hadn't left. I said, hey, man, you need to leave. You know, that's not very pastoral of you. So what do you mean? He said, well, last night you said you're the pastor. I said, yeah, I'm the pastor. He said, well, you know, you could be more polite to me. You could let me stay longer. Who am I hurting being here? I don't know if that's very Christ-like of you. Suddenly I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know if it is either. You know, really? I said to him, well, we have it posted right there. That's kind of Christ-like, isn't it? We said right there it's not. You're not supposed to be just having your car dumped here in our parking lot and sleeping in the lot. But I knew what I was preaching on this weekend. I knew the text. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how profoundly it would have changed his life if I would have said to he and his girlfriend, you know, Doug, why don't you come to our house tonight? Why don't you come on over, let me make a pot of chili. We'll go ahead and we'll feed you. We've got an extra bedroom. You guys, I'm not going to judge your life. You guys go in there and crash there and stay as long as you want. You are welcome. How many of you think I would have been crazy to do that? Oh, totally. I think I would have been crazy to do that too. I may have been axe murdered for all I know. But either way, there's that part of you that thinks, okay, was I eager to practice that hospitality? Challenged with it. Challenged with it. For each of us, so it says there are five ways we can live our love and change lives. Because really, how are, how are you living out your love today? I mean, can you write out how you're living your love out today for Christ Jesus? I mean, you know, this is how I'm living my love. This is how my love is being lived out through my life today. And you see, we need to be able to do it in every area of our life. So, first way we can live out our love and change lives is to open up. Is to open up. Become vulnerable. Go there. Be God's best. Be you. You know, who God created in you is exactly what God wants from you. God doesn't want you to be someone different. He wants you to be the best you that he created. He wants you to be the vet, not the worst you, not the you with all the bad habits, not the you that goes down all the wrong directions, but your best you. That you that you've had dreams that you were a little kid about. That you that you feel within you wanting to break out. That you that God has created within. God wants that you to open up and come out. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. The people that you see that you want to tell them that you love them, the people that you know that you would like to embrace and just say, man, it's so great to see you. The people that you're afraid of what's going to happen and so pride holds you from really getting involved with them. Don't hold back, but open up. Go there. I love the quote at the bottom of your card by Brene Brown. Faith minus vulnerability and mystery equals extremism. If you've got all the answers, then don't call what you do faith. What's the Bible definition of faith? It's believing in something that what? You can't see, right? You can't see. And if you can't see it, do you have all the answers to it? No, you don't have all the answers to anything you can't see. And you see, for everybody that starts following Christ Jesus and starts having all the answers... Because, doggone it, I read four chapters of the Bible, and I know it all, or I've got my four spiritual laws, and I know it all, or whatever reason. Once you think you've got all the answers, you are stepping outside the realm of faith and into extremism. I want you to know, as I get older as a pastor, guess what kind of pastors I'm around? Older pastors. I'm around a lot more older pastors. This is the truth. And you know what older pastors generally talk about how we really don't have all the answers we thought we had when we were younger. And I've discovered that a lot of us, just as people in general, as we get older, we start understanding that, boy, was I mixed up when I was younger, you know? And it's a lot easier to have a lot more latitude with folks as I get older because who did I think I was? And for us to open up, to be God's best, just to 
not that we've got it all. Second way we can live our love and change lives is to honor God every day. That's to do the right thing. Honor God every day. Are you honoring God every day with your life? Now, you see, this is a challenging text. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. This has been a challenging week from the Pope to the President, hasn't it? I mean, this has been a challenging week all the way across. I mean, if you're talking about the Pope, that poor guy was already scheduled to go to Ireland. He couldn't cancel the trip to Ireland when everything came out from Pennsylvania and all the, all the additional um, charges against these 300 priests that had been molesting children. I mean, 300, and that's just one state? And they're going through all these additional states. I don't know if you saw it. Just last night, it was released. They're saying that Pope Francis knew about this in 2013 and hadn't addressed it. And going into the middle of this, I mean, what do you do? Not to mention what the president has gone through this week as a people that have been his, like, best friends. I mean, what did he call it? They're flipping on him. Or I guess you call it telling the truth, right? I mean, they're doing one or the other. I mean, they're going ahead and they're starting to say something and suddenly he's feeling more and more isolated and we're having all of this stuff come out and people say, well, wait a second. Pastor Eric, you're speaking against Catholicism. Wait a second, Pastor Eric, you're speaking against my political spectrum. Is this political or is this Catholicism, one faith or the other? What does it say there? Let's read it out loud together. Let's read it out loud together. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. What does the quote say? There is but one rule of conduct for a person. Some of you have gotten this card for me enough times that you've had it memorized. To do the right thing. The cost may be dear in money, in friends, in influence, in labor, in a prolonged and painful sacrifice. But the cost not to do right is far more dear. Romans 12, 21, I asked you to memorize seven weeks ago. I don't know if you've memorized it yet, but it's right there. If you haven't memorized it, you can read it aloud with me. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by what? Doing good. Now, do you think this quote, do the right thing, and this verse would have kept a lot of folks out of trouble in this past week? You think the Pope wishes all those priests would have listened to all of this in the past week? And do you think the President wishes, oh man, how did I get myself in this mess all these years ago now that I'm finding myself in today? And how many of us occasionally feel like, oh, I'm in this mess today because I'm still not hating what is wrong and I'm still clinging to the wrong thing and not loving what is good. Friends, at some point, we decide to honor God every day in our lives. And that's how we live our love. Third way we can live our love and change lives is to be true. Be you. For those of you who don't know it, this is a cool song by Eddie Vedder, Be True. And that's, you know, and he sings this, and for those of you who don't know who Eddie Vedder is, he used to be in Pearl Jam. But anyway, now he sings, he does this song in the ukulele. I highly recommend if you've got a streaming music service, just go and download Be True by Eddie Vedder. It's such a cool song on the ukulele. But for us to be true, just to be you, let God shape and share you. God wants to use who you are. God doesn't want you to be Pastor Eric. God forbid that as wonderful as Claire should be, that she would ever become Pastor Eric. That would be a horrible thing. I mean, Claire, if anyone's ever been hugged or loved by Claire, you know that Claire is like light years ahead of Pastor Eric in every single one of those bright ways. I mean, every single one of those ways. But God wants Claire to be Claire. I mean, the very best Claire that she can be. And God wants Don to be Don, the very best Don that she can be. And God wants Shannon to be Shannon, the very best Shannon that she can be, and the very best Ozell and the very best each one of us. God wants us to be exactly who we can be. God takes and shapes us, and then he wants to share us with the world. And he shapes us as we're redeemed in him. It says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. I really think one of the reasons we don't honor each other 
is because we're afraid we're going to lose some of ourselves. I think we're afraid that somehow in lifting someone, other, someone else up, we're letting ourselves down. And what we need to understand in that honoring others, we have an opportunity to begin to lift up people, and in lifting them up, we're lifting up God and the God within them. And God is pleased with us. I've had so much fun doing, and I, I know most of you are ignoring it because I can see how many people watch it, my um, five minutes set apart from the heart on the streets. Each week I do an interview. How many of you have ever watched one of my interviews on the streets? Thank you. I, I hope all of you will. I post them at ericfitton.com. You can see them there. I post them on my Facebook page. I post them at Jack for Jesus Facebook page. You can see it almost anywhere on the internet. All you have to do is go type on the internet, Google Eric Denton five minutes set apart. But guys on the street literally stand in line on the corner, not just for a meal now, but for the van because that's how I choose who I do the interview with. Because I pay them, I pay them $20. I say, this is what's gonna happen now. I'm asking for five honest minutes from you. And I believe that deserves payment. So I'm going to give, and, they, and guys will tell me I'll do it for free, Eric. You know, we never asked. Me. I said, no. I mean, if you're going to sit down with me, I just think you deserve to earn something. I mean, doesn't everyone deserve to earn something, have a little bit of money in their pocket occasionally in life? And I sit down with them and I ask them three questions. I say, how did it happen? In other words, how did you get on the streets of Los Angeles? How did you come from Skid Row? And guys always start where they were born, where their mom and dad were, how it ended up, how, usually drugs, gangs, drugs, prison. The, you put those three together, it's right in there. And then I say, how hard is it living on the street? And then they'll start talking about poverty, whether they sleep on a tent, whether they, they tell me where they sleep. Tell, and if you're curious about anything, you can just watch the interviews. And then I ask them the third question, which is really a challenging one, I think. How has it changed you living in poverty? What kind of changes has it made in your personal life? And you wouldn't believe how vulnerable people get. I mean, believe me, they don't get that vulnerable for $20. And they just start, you know? And this is, overridingly, this is it. One of the things that's changed me is that I grew up looking at people who were poor, thinking that they were bad. But now that I'm poor and I live on the streets, I realize that I looked at people the wrong way. And I understand that they're just people who are poor. And something bad happened in their lives. And then they'll often tell me a sad story. Say, you wouldn't believe how many people are out here who shouldn't be here, who have mental health problems, who have physical problems. They'll say, there are veterans here on the street. They shouldn't be out here. They're here because of an injury in Vietnam or something. They've been out here for decades. And it's heartbreaking. And these guys who are living on the streets are heartbroken for other people on the streets. Friends, you and me, we need to remember this quote in the middle of your card there. It says this, the purp purpose of life is not to be happy. Let's say that out loud because I don't think we get it. The purpose of life is not to be happy. And friends, if you've been aiming your whole life at the day where you finally get to kick back, you finally get to do what you want, you finally get to be happy. That was not your purpose, and you were not created for that. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful. It is to be honorable. It is to be compassionate. It is to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. It is to make a difference in your, with your life that you have lived and lived well that someone's going to take note that this person was on this planet and they made a difference with their lives. It's one of the joys of the fellowship of the church. Together we're working in Christ Jesus to make a difference in Riverside, to be a light on this corner, a lighthouse to other churches, to be a beacon of service, to be hands and hope for Christ Jesus. If you're just here thinking, man, how can I be happy 
You're no different than a kid in high school wondering where he can score dope that Friday night to go have a party. How can I be happy? Except you waited a lot longer to do it. Our job is to be useful, and that's to be honorable, compassionate, to make a difference. Fourth way we can live our love and change lives is to invest everything. Invest everything. Nothing's going with you. How many of you think you're taking some of it with you when you die? None of us do, and we all know this, right? We've been told this a bazillion times, but how many of us live like we're taking all of it with us? We all live like we're taking all of it with us. I mean, I could go to your homes and go through your garages, go through your closets with the stuff that you're saving as if you're taking it with you. Friends, the junk you've got, someone's going to throw away. The money you're keeping, someone's going to waste. Your kids might use it on drugs or hurting themselves or bad things. The garbage you've got, they'll think is just that, it's garbage. There is nothing that's going with you. And so invest everything in that which God has given us. It says, never be lazy, work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically. Does it say until when? Does it say when do you get to stop? Does it have that there? Until, this is your cutoff date. You know, your 20 years are in, Don. You know, that's it. You're over. I'll tell you what. It doesn't have that there. That's not there, friends. And it's not there because there is no retirement age with God. You don't retire from the kingdom of God. For us, our lives, this is it. Haven't any of you ever seen? So in, in the church I grew up, there were lots of old people. Lots of old folks. And here at Central Community, believe it or not, there are a few old folks here, too. I mean, but the church I grew up in in Long Beach, there were lots of old folks. But you know what they called the old folks in the church? Some of you grew up in a church must know. No, saints. Saints, they called them the saints. The old people were called the saints. I'm just about there. I'm just about at the spot right now. And after this haircut, I mean, they might have been calling me a saint. Um... It's just one of those, Debbie looked at me after I got my hair cut, she didn't know I was going to get it cut, and it came and she said, honey, I remember when you've had eyebrows longer than that hair. But I think, I think for each of us, I mean, you know, it's one of those times where for us, they weren't called saints because they retired as saints, it's because they were living saintly lives still. They had had an entire life lift up and they were being examples in the church. I love the quote by Norman Cousins. And I shared it on Facebook when I was writing this message, and I can't believe how many times it's been shared by other people now and been spread all over the place because it's just one of those things that resounds with us. But it says, the tragedy of life is not death, but what we let die inside of us while we live. How many of you have had a big dream? You've had a big hope. You've had a big love. And somewhere along the line, you just let it go. Often when I speak, like when I speak to business groups, like last week, and I'll say to them, did any of you ever, when you were a kid, want to be a missionary? Or did any of you ever want to be a preacher? And you wouldn't believe how many hands go up. People who don't even go to church anymore. I mean, they're there on a Sunday morning. And they, they raise their hands. You too, huh? Yes. And, you know, the people just raise their hands. How did you let go of that dream? What was it that robbed that dream from you that allowed it to die? You know, you don't have to allow it to die. That dream can be wonderful. Here at Central Community, we're so fortunate. We have missions like Siempre para los Niños. You want to go down there? The dream is alive at Siempre para los Niños. We had a group this last Wednesday. Well, they've been there the whole week at Samaritan House. Um, been there from Ma Madras, is how you pronounce it. I said in Madras, I got it wrong. Madras, Oregon. This pastor, he pastors two different churches. He drives between them like an old circuit-riding preacher. He's 33 years old. He's a young kid, and he's brought 25 people down. They flew down with their little children, kids my grandkids' age. Young people in their 30s with kids, 
and they're down there staying at Samaritan House. They've worked all week. Within two hours of being there, they had their entire puppet ministry set up, and they were doing minions puppets. You know, me, 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 me. You know, and they, had, they did the entire gospel story with that. I don't know how they did it, but I'll tell you what. We had little kids from Siempre, like, crying and giving their hearts to Jesus. These guys had flown down there. They were so excited. When I left, they hugged me and thanked me for letting them come. They thanked me for letting them be a part of what was happening at Siempre para los Niños. You can go anytime you want. We've got jackets for Jesus. Four months from today will be the day after Christmas. Four months from today, Thanksgiving will be a month behind us. Four months from today, Christmas Eve services will be two nights before. Four months from today, all of it will be done. We are either going to focus on getting it right in the next four months, or it won't happen. Here at Central Community, we're invited to be a part of all of that. The tragedy of life is not death. Everybody dies. The tragedy of life is what you let die inside of us while we live. And friends, there are so many people who let the dream and the hope and the love die inside of them while they're still alive. And you say, well, how do you get up and go to work every day? Oh, because I killed my dreams. Man, I, if I still had dreams, I couldn't go to this job. I mean, this job, this job would be insufferable if I still had dreams. But you see, I put my dreams behind me. They're done. You see, what if we just let our dreams out into the open? And finally, the fifth way we can live our love and change lives is to bring the party more often than the preacher. Bring the party more often than the preacher. How many of you really want a preacher at your parties? <laughs> hardly anybody, believe me. Hardly anybody. When I marry people, I hardly ever stay for the receptions. I don't stay for the receptions because I know folks are going to get drunk. And when I'm at a business retreat like Saturday night and they want me to open up the big dinner on Saturday night, I know they're going to play musical chairs and they're going to dance until midnight. There's going to be way too much liquor. They don't want me there at midnight. At midnight, I'm going to be down there casting out demons. I mean, it's going to be awful. And so they, I'm, I leave before midnight and I call them to the altar Sunday morning. And I remind them of what they did the night before. I mean, you need to regain your innocence right here. I mean, for each of us, we need to learn how to bring the party more often. What does it say? Rejoice in our confident hope. If you're going to your friends and you're thinking you're going to win them to Christ Jesus because you're preaching at them, maybe not. But what if you're rejoicing with them? You rejoice with those who rejoice. You weep with those who weep. That's exactly where this verse comes from. And when we go and we rejoice with them, and we bring the party, and we learn how to love them. It took me a long time to learn that on Sunday nights. It's the reason Jackets for Jesus is so popular on the street. Sunday nights, I'm a much different person than I am here. Sunday nights, I'm like Mr. Celebration. Sunday nights, I tell a joke. Sunday nights, I walk up and down that line. You would think I'm the most friendly guy on the planet Earth. I'm out there on the streets because I realize these guys have been sleeping on the street every night all week long. Do they need me to come down and preach a sermon? There are people who say to me, Pastor Eric, you really should be preaching a sermon here. These guys really need to hear the message of the gospel. How many of those people can go to any of those missions in downtown LA and hear the message of the gospel anytime they want? Anytime. And so my job is to come, bring a meal, bring the joy, bring the celebration. For us, we have that opportunity to rejoice in your... So it says how, there are three ways how. And this is the way how that will take you through the rest of your life. And I know these don't sound rejoicing, but if you do these three things, three blanks right there, it will help you get through. The first way is patience. If you're thinking rejoicing isn't working for me today, be patient. Rejoicing will work for you eventually. Second way is prayer. You think, yeah, I'm just not much of a rejoicing type of person. I have a hard time smiling, Pastor Eric. I don't even like it when someone hugs me in church. Claire keeps coming over and hugging me. I mean, it's, Pastor Eric, it's so hard for me. I'm glad you told me that blonde-headed woman's name is Claire. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that hug. Um, you know, whatever it is, it's, if you have a hard time with rejoicing and embracing one another, start praying and pray for yourself. 
God, open up my heart and then practice. Start practicing. Practicing what you need to be doing with your life. Put it into practice. You know, I am just now getting good at Jackets for Jesus. Just now, I've been doing it every Sunday night for 30 years. I mean, when I'm in Palm Springs on Sunday morning, I'm still on the streets of Los Angeles on Sunday night. And you know what i do? In the beginning, I would keep it a secret because I felt so guilty. Oh, man, I was on Palm Springs eating great big fancy meals, sleeping in a great big fancy hotel room, and now I'm down here on Skid Row. Now I go down there, and I tell the guys, you know where I was last night, you guys? Where, Eric, where? And I'm yelling at the top of my lungs for 200 people. Man, I was in Palm Springs at a hotel that had a pool so big that it has a sand beach. How many of you have ever seen a sand beach at a hotel? Not a hand goes through. It's incredible. Well, how do you get the sand off before you go in the pool? You don't. You just go right in the pool with sand all over you. It's great. And boy, I'm feedbacking all over the place here. Um, it's great just to get right into the water with the sand all over you, and the guys are just loving the story. You see, my life, I live in wealth. I can't be ashamed of that wealth. And so for me to step into that and to share it, it's patience, it's prayer, it's practice. Inside your program today, there should be a little card. It's a card that I had made up for last week's retreat. Their theme was Carpe Diem. And it got to my house after I left. It arrived after I left, so I didn't get to hand it out. So I thought, well, doggone it, I'll be giving it out for a while. I've got 500 of them. So I'll be giving it out. But this is a quote that I've shared with you before on the front of it. It's on, in fact, it's on the top of the church's webpage, I think. It's on one of our webpages. Today matters. It will be what makes tomorrow worthwhile. Do good. Be happy. Make the most of it. Begin your adventure where you are right now. And then it says, carpe diem. You know what that means? Seize the day. Seize the day. It's Latin. It means seize the day. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Seize the day. And then on the back, it says we can change in three simple steps. And I got these from a message I preached to you just three weeks ago. I just preached this message to you guys. Just welcome, serve, encourage. Which are the three points I preached just this last week. I said, hey, you guys want to be successful in your relationship with God. You need to learn how to welcome. You need to learn how to serve. You need to learn how to encourage. For us, with a simple quote beneath that that says, our vision for the future is clouded by our desire to be accepted in the here and now. And how many of us were so worried about being accepted in the here and now that our vision for our dreams that God has given, our hopes that God has given, living out our, our, our love. And we need to learn how to celebrate now, and we need to learn how to begin today. When we begin today, and live out our love. God changes a simple prayer at the bottom of your card says this. Thanks for making me an incredible instrument. Help me to live my love gloriously, fearlessly, every day, as if that day were my last. Thanks. Heavenly Father, you know where we've gone wrong, Father, and where we've been judgmental, where we've stepped aside, Father, and where we've lost our hope. Lord, you know the dreams and the visions that we once had for our lives, God, that somehow slipped away and we've allowed to die within us. We would ask right now, Lord Jesus, that you would come into our hearts, that you would renew those dreams, that you would renew that hope, Father, that you would wake us up to that which is good, to that which is perfect, to that which is wonderful, to that which is you, God, within us. We would ask that you would wake us up to live our love with everyone we meet, that we might be enthusiastic, that we might be eager, that we might be ready to love the people around us even when they're unlovable, God, to honor those around us even when they don't deserve honor, God, to hate what is wrong and to hold on to that which is right. Lord Jesus, we would ask that you would change our hearts and that you would make us into who you would want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.